The Canadian medical world was rocked by a shocking scandal when a nurse admitted to playing a vital role in the demise of eight people. What could have prompted the medical practitioner to carry out such evil acts? In the never-before-seen interrogation of a twisted-minded nurse who brought more pain than succor to the lives of those under her care, you are about to understand the motive behind the actions of Elizabeth Wetlawfer. Elizabeth's troubled and failed romantic relationships form part of the reason why she may have snapped. With access to prescription drugs, it was not long before she was addicted to these self-prescribed treatments. She was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and so she had to be placed on antidepressants. All of these may have led to her acts of evil against her patients. If she was not exposed at the time she was, she would have increased her evil tally by six more innocent lives. Elizabeth had already written a four-page statement to the authorities before this confession you are about to watch. However, this is a follow-up interrogation to gain further insight into the very details of what she did. The detective who interviews her walks into the room and introduces himself to her. After some familiarization, he gets into the interview. Following her previously made statement, the detective attempts to build on this. He asks for a brief file history, and so she starts by telling him about her work history. She touches on the places she has worked, her roles as a registered nurse, and the various things she was required to do as a nurse. In the course of her discussion, she tells him that she was assigned to some of the sickest people in the hospital. Sometimes they were terminally ill, and she knew they were in their final hours. The detective asks about her addiction, and she says she began to have these addictions in 2006. Um, back at Metal Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, hi, Okay. In attending to her sick patients, Elizabeth sometimes stole their medications after they passed on. I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of okay. by stealing it from the patients. Okay. This went on undiscovered for a long time. However, there were times in her career when her addictions could not be hidden. For instance, she was once found passed out cold in the basement after consuming unhealthy amounts of alcohol. Another time, her drug usage led to a wrong medication prescription that almost led to the loss of a patient's life. She tells the detective how she had access to the medications she constantly abused. She tells him that she had been able to overcome her addiction. Although it relapsed at a point, she says she's in a much better place now. She also mentions getting help from the AA to deal with her drinking problem. I'm going to stop using alcohol as well. I have friends in AA and I've got a very clear plan. If, if I'm able to be out and about, I have a very clear plan. And I also know if I'm not able to be out and about, that AA and Narcotics Anonymous do have some programs where they come into prison. Considering the magnitude of her crimes, Elizabeth must be delusional to think that she will walk free and even have the time or freedom to be part of the AA. The detective asks about her family, and she gives him a comprehensive detail of the people in her life, her elder parents, her cousins, and all. Then she talks about her marriage, which lasted about a decade before they broke up. What about family? You were born and raised in Woodstock? Yeah, born and raised in Woodstock, uh, married from 2000 and, er, from 97 to 2007. Okay. We broke up um, February 2007. No children. I wanted them, he never did. As she continues, it is clear that she left the marriage filled with bitterness in her heart. It's at this point she claims that she began to hear voices in her head. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my, for my borderline personality disorder. And I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me, I'll use you, don't worry about it. She says she's not sure if it was a divine voice or the voice of the devil. Soon, she began to overdose her sick patients with insulin, losing eight patients. The different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the, um, through the insulin, I believe it 
it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. In her mentally sick state, she must have imagined herself as some angel of justice, bringing her patients peace instead of suffering through their ailments, or like an angel of judgment, ridding the world of those sick people. At some point, she was moved from her duty point and assigned to treat children. This is where she seemingly grew a conscience as she wasn't sure if she could administer huge doses of insulin to sick children. She decides to resign and leave behind her practice and seek help. My uh, supervisor came to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry. We want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids through schools in Ingrid Falls that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingrid Falls. Okay. And I panicked. I panicked. I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, what if? So the kids. So about... It wasn't about a week after that that I quit. She tells the detectives that she confided in a few people and they advised her to seek help. Before I went, I told, um, two, I told three people what was going on. And they With this information, these people could be arrested for acting as accessories to her since they were aware but never bothered to inform the police. The detective soon delves into questions about the people who had lost their lives at her hands. The first victim went by the name James Wilcox. Elizabeth says that he was an indecent man who liked to touch the nurses inappropriately. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurses' uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to f*** all of us. She was going to f*** all of us, doc. And, this would say the first things, and he did touch me inappropriately once. She tells the detective that administering the insulin that took his life wasn't so difficult as the hospital had insulin pins at an area where any staff could pick for their use. She believes that after her breakup with her husband, she was given a special task, and this is what she must have thought she was doing for her innocent patients. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. No. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. Wilcox was quite elderly, but didn't have diabetes. However, he had dementia, and so he wasn't in complete charge of his mental state. The diagnosis of, of his health at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see his face. In the 80s? Yeah. After her sad act of overdosing on him, he gave up hours later, and Elizabeth signs off his demise as a non-coroner demise. How about my surgery? I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin, not, not diabetic. So I went into a I used up uh, one of insulin pen, borrowed insulin. And that was how I got my surgery. I used up borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3.30, the PSW, well, throughout the night, he was yelling out, I love you, and I'm sorry. And, not to, not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in his room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm -hmm. And then at 3.30, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So I did what we're supposed to do. This is a course for concern, as no one can even begin to imagine how many cases of medical practitioners who have taken the lives of their patients will never be discovered. She says she felt terrible, especially as Wilcox's family couldn't stop thanking her for taking care of their father in the last moments. And indeed, she did take care of him. You were speaking with the family? Yeah. And is that the, uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yeah, I've been there for him, yeah. How does that make you feel? Awful. Yeah. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. 
No, I felt awful. Her next victim was Maurice. And again, she says he was also an indecent man, as he found every opportunity to inappropriately touch the nurses. Let me look at your interaction with Maurice. He was another one who liked to grab breasts and asses. Okay. He was sometimes a, a patient of mine. See, at that time, I wasn't, I didn't have a set floor that I worked on. I worked on all the different floors of the nurse, kind of filling in. Okay. One day, as she attended to him, he grabbed her, and she felt an urge in her belly to end his life. One afternoon, I was working with him, and he did grab me. And uh, again, I got that feeling inside that this is his time to go. She carried out this dark desire by injecting the septuagenarian with insulin before her shift. She returns the next day to find out that he is no more. I gave him an overdose of insulin after supper, and uh, I believe he died the next day. And what was your shift that? Do you remember what shift it you were working at that It was 3 to 11. 3 p.m.? Yeah, to 11 p.m. To 11 p.m. So, like so he, died, he died when I wasn't there. Okay. The next one on her list is Helen Matheson in 2011. The next person on your list is Helen Matheson? Yeah. Okay. So you go from September or October to 07. Yeah. And then Helen was 2011. Yeah. Unlike the men, Helen was quiet and didn't cause any trouble. Did you get along with her okay? Did she ever do anything to, to harm you or? No, no, she was very quiet. It was just, I got that feeling that this yeah, she's next, time to go. For some reason, however, Elizabeth believed that she needed to go and overdose her. It's almost scary to imagine the number of demises that Elizabeth may have been directly responsible for as she worked with elderly and terminally sick people. Mary Zerowinski was her next victim in November 2011. November 2011. Mm -hmm. Mary Zerowinski, is that yeah. how you recall uh, her last name being pronounced? Yeah. And this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay, and you said that she wasn't a diabetic, but she had dementia? That's right. For some reason, the patient had some sort of premonition that it was her last day. She even asks Elizabeth to wheel her into a bed in preparation for her departure. She didn't hurt the nurse in the right and she's just very outspoken and feisty, and one night she said, you know, I'm going to die tonight. Mary said that? Yeah. And I said, oh. And she said, yeah, why don't you get me into the, why don't you get me into the, the deathbed so I can die. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yeah, put me to bed, I'm going to die. So I said, okay, and I went to the other nurse that was working with me, and uh, she said, oh, okay, well, let's put her in the side of the care room if that's what you want. So we did, and then I thought, well, she must be the next one. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling inside of me she must be the next one. Because she was saying she was going to die, but there's no signs she was going to die. Eventually, Elizabeth administers the insulin, and Mary gives up the ghost a couple of days later. Elizabeth has no reason to take the life of anyone, even if they asked for it. She could never escape the guilt after her deeds, but kept going in the same direction. How did your emotions start to, to feel as it um, kept continuing? I kept having a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt. The next victim was an elderly woman in her 90s, Gladys Millard. Elizabeth remembers her as being stubborn, having dementia, eating poorly, and generally loving to act up. So this takes us to November of 2011 mm -hmm. at Crescent Care. Um, it says here Gladys was a type 2 diabetic um, and had dementia. So you dementia. Did she? Yeah. How old do you think Gladys was? Nine, 92. 92. On one account, she attacked a man when she heard that he wasn't treating his wife right. She once punched a man oh. because uh, she, she overheard the nurses telling one of the gentlemen, no, you can't push your wife around, you have to come with us. And she turned around and she said, you can't treat a woman like that. Boom! And hit the man. And hit the man. <laughs> Elizabeth says she later got the nudging within her that this was her next victim and again carried out her evil act of overdosing her. The detective asks if she ever had the feeling to take anyone's life at home, but she says she never did. Did you ever get that feeling outside of work? No, never. The urge always came when she was at work. The detective asks her if there were any cameras in the treatment rooms, and she says there weren't any. Were there cameras in, in the bedroom? No. No? no. no. Nothing at all? No. 
This means that just about anything could have been done by any medical practitioner without evidence for it. Elizabeth's next victim will be a 90-year-old woman, Helen Young. Again, she felt it was in her place to end the woman's life. What do you want help with? I want to die. Why can't you help me die? I want to die. And one night, it was like something snapped inside. In this case, however, after injecting the woman who was always begging to die, she turned red as the adverse effect of the insulin set in. She came back and I thought, okay, you will die. So, uh, I gave her a shot. I came up to her and said, this is for your pain. And I gave her a shot of long acting or short acting. And she started to settle down. And then, um... Later on, we put in her into bed and I gave her more, off, more of the uh, insulin. I think it was long acting. She had a seizure. She turned red. She um, was diaphoretic. Shortly afterward, another nurse came to relieve her of her duty and noticed Helen's terrible situation. She called Elizabeth to help her with the patient, but she only pretended to attend to the woman as she knew she was responsible for the woman's pain. PSWs called me to the bedside. Um, I took all of her vital signs and I pretended to take a blood sugar. Every time these crimes happened, Elizabeth claims she remembers hearing a voice that resembled the cackling of someone from hell. At some point, she confided in a pastor who prayed over her, but failed to report her crimes, as he probably didn't take her seriously. However, Elizabeth wasn't done yet. Shortly afterward, her bloodthirst would come to the fore again. Maureen Pickering will be the next person to meet her sad fate at Elizabeth's hand. According to her, Maureen was quite a handful and had no problems pinching and pulling in other patients' hair. She would attack other patients, she would pull their hair, she would hit them, she would pinch them. Elizabeth recalls the rising urge to put an end to the troublesome woman's life but she says she didn't want this to happen. And I had had to look after her. I got this idea. I thought, you know, I'm starting to get the feeling of that surge again. I thought, no, I don't want her to die. Instead, she thought of injecting her with a sufficient dose to cause her to slip into a coma. If I could somehow give her enough of a dose to give her a coma or something to change her brain waves. Well, that didn't work out, and the woman lost her life eventually. Elizabeth soon was fired from her job because of medication errors, resulting in a patient having a seizure. Fortunately, the patient survived, but once the authorities found out that she was responsible, her appointment was terminated. She later got another job after admitting her mistakes to a new employee. The magnanimous employer took her in, and it wasn't long before she found her next victim. In her new place of work, which was a contract to last one year, she would go on to fatally inject Arpad Horvath. Some of the other fortunate patients who survived Elizabeth's unlawful use of insulin include Sandra Taller and Beverly Bertram. However, she was charged for her attempts to take their lives. As the detective finishes his session, he runs through some of the areas of the case. Although Elizabeth is making a full confession, all of her accounts will need to be double-checked. Everywhere she has worked also will need to be investigated, and all the records of those who lost their lives when she worked there will have to be checked. Again, every person who was aware of her evil but never came forward to inform the authorities will have to be questioned to ascertain if they can be charged for aiding her crimes. Elizabeth's story is rather complex. In one breath, she is a helpful person who will do everything in her power to help. And in the next, she doesn't hesitate to harm and recklessly takes lives. She never derived any pleasure from her acts, but felt terribly guilty afterward. She is eventually arrested and charged for her role in the demise of eight patients and those who survived her medical attacks. At her hearing, she willingly confessed to her crimes and was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences without the possibility of parole for 25 years. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see more stories on true crime, then be sure to subscribe to our channel. This way, you'll be notified every single time we upload new videos. Thanks for watching.